about our um, Idris category theory libraries, and uh, I will. Okay. So I mean, uh, Yale already briefly told you what a category is. Now we all know that a category is a bunch of Apple connectors. Uh, but the problem is, since uh, basically the whole state box is based on category theory, then an obvious question to ask is, OK, where is the category theory? And that's where part of the category theory happens. So we need a library to implement this thing. And that's what Idris City is. So Idris City is a library written in Idris to do category theory. Uh, the idea is basically trying to translate some concepts of category theory so that they can be employed in industry. Uh, you can find it at this link. Uh, it's licensed um, under AGPL3. Uh, license exemptions are available if you really don't like it, but you really should like it. So um, Everyone can contribute by making pull requests. Uh, quite lately, we are actually receiving some pull requests, which is really nice. So it's like not a completely you know, psychotic project. There are other people in the world that are <laughs> actually liking it, which is great. And uh, we also do mob programming sessions um, every Thursday. Uh, every is like quasi, it's like wrapped in a monad. It's like more or less every Thursday at 4 p.m. Um, Amsterdam time. So you can just uh, log in on Twitch and uh, see us programming. If you do, please write in the chat because we are used to have five people on the Twitch channel, which are usually the five people that do the mob programming session. So if you don't signal us that you are there and ask questions, that would be difficult to you know, act in a way which is friendly and you know, explaining what we are doing. Uh, so why Idris? OK, that's probably the main question. Like, uh, have you ever heard about Idris? Who's heard about Idris? Oh, OK, yeah, so that's OK, whatever. Uh, I'm used to talk with that to dumb people, people sorry. But anyway, uh, Idris is a functional programming language with dependent types. Um, why Idris is because, uh, I mean, if you look at dependently typed languages, yeah, there are uh, other uh, solutions, but Idris in particular is aimed at production. And at least this is what the design behind it wants. So code is uh, made to be efficient. So it is true. I mean, uh, I'm including this line because every time you name Idris, someone will ask you why Agda. There are actually many reasons for this. Uh, at the moment, Agda is probably a bit faster than Idris, but Idris 2 is, I think, in alpha stage right now. Uh, it's pre-alpha, uh, but it looks very promising. And yeah, it's, it's, it's ready, exactly. <laughs> So this is the idea. With the dependent types, we can implement definitions in a verified way. Namely, we can basically just open Maclean, which is the to-go reference if you want to learn category theory, and uh, just you know, like look at definitions and implement them like verbatim. That's, that's the idea. That's what we wanted to do. So we wanted to adopt a very vanilla approach, literally. So I'll show you an example. Uh, in this case, is what a category is. So we start saying that a category is a record, so basically a bunch of things. Uh, and we specify a constructor. So we specify a list of things that you need to provide to uh, basically build a category. So we'll, uh, you will have to provide objects. So there is a type that denotes an object. And every term of type obj will be an object in our category. Then you will have a type morphism. This represents the arrows between objects. And the way you do it is with this uh, function thing. You give me two objects, and I will give you the type of all the arrows between them. Then you need identities, because the real point of category theory is that for each object, there is this morphism, which is the identity morphism, that captures the idea that is the morphism that does nothing. And the way you do it is you say, if you give me an object, A, I will give you a selected morphism from A to A, which is the identity on the object A. Um, then there is composition. Uh, so after we specify the arrows, we have to compose them. Uh, and again, this basically works by saying, OK, uh, I want to go from A to B and from B to C, which are these objects here. This will be made implicit at some point. Uh, then you give me two morphisms, one from A to B and one from B to C, and I'll, and I'll give you a morphism from A to C. That's what the definition says. 
So up to now, this is everything you need to specify a category, right? No, because the point is, if I just give you this stuff, there's no way to prove that um, this thing forms a category. Like there is no way to say that actually the composition is associative and the categorical laws are enforced. So we also require this. Um, this basically is the left identity law. So what this means is that for each couple of objects and each morphism from uh, one to the other, you have to give me a proof that if you compose this morphism with the identity, it's like doing nothing. There is also a right identity for like the other side. Uh, and then there is this, which is basically saying that, again, for each fortuple, quadruple of objects and three morphisms, you have to give a proof that the composition is associative. Now, if you determine all these things, if you give all these things, then you can be sure that what you specified is a category. So this is a verified definition of category. So what can you do with this thing? Uh, well, we got quite far. Uh, we implemented the basic things, so categories, functors, and natural transformations. Uh, we also implemented products, coproducts, initial and terminal objects, and if I am not wrong, we have also something about limits going on in uh, the general sense. Uh, we implemented uh, monoidal categories and symmetric monoidal categories for people that don't know what they are. Uh, these are basically categories where you can compose arrows sequentially, like in normal categories, but also in parallel. And these are super important, like 90% of applications of category theory in a way or another are these kind of things. Because if you think about processes, you can stack processes and compose them horizontally, but you can also uh, you want also to say, oh, actually this thing is happening while this other thing is happening and they are really not related. So a lot of applied category theory in a way or another uh, ends up being related to this thing. So it, it was fundamental to have this thing in. Then uh, we implemented monads uh, and Kleisley category. Yes, uh, it's like the M word, yes. Um, and I mean, these are all definitions. So we implemented all these things as definitions, but we also gave, uh, gave some examples. Uh, so for instance, we were able to prove that Idris types and functions form a category. This is important because now if I define a category in the abstract and I provide a functor from this thing to this category, then I have an instant way to execute my stuff because everything I do gets mapped to a bunch of functions wired together and I can execute them. Um, we implemented discrete categories, but this is actually very easy, and uh, free categories. Uh, I will show you, I think, now that Idri the Idris types and functions example, and later on the free categories one. Yeah. So, okay, let's let's show how how you use this thing in practice. We want to prove that Idris types and functions form a category. Uh, so we uh, basically start by giving some helper functions. So. For instance, we define type morphism AB as the set of Idrin's functions from A to B, the type A to B. We also have this other thing, uh, which is identity. Uh, and as identity, this thing is basically saying that if you give me a type, I will pick as identity the Idris identity on that type, which is always provided by Idris. Uh, composition. Well, composition, since we are using uh, Idris types and functions, it's obviously just Idris function composition. So in here we are saying that if you give me two things like this, which are just elements in here, from A to B and from B to C, just compose them using what Idris means for composition. Uh, OK, identity laws. Well, identity laws are easy, because the point is that Idris automatically reduces G composed with identity to G. So basically, to provide the identity law, uh, you just say, OK, you give me two types. You give me a function from A to B. And this thing is just raffle. So this thing is just saying, because Idris already considers these two things equal. So we have to do nothing. Uh, right identity is a symmetrical case, so it's the same. And also associativity is the same. Because again, the composition of functions in Idris is naturally associative. 
and that's it. Like after I put all these things together and I can get the definition of category. So you see now we are basically saying that all objects are Idris types. Our morphisms are exactly this for each couple of objects. I'll give you the set of functions between them. Identity we define is this for each type is just Idris identities. Composition is just Idris function composition. And these proofs in this case are rather trivial because they're all raffle. So OK, now you may ask, are there any problems uh, with these things? Uh, yes, obviously. I mean, it's, it's programming after all. So. Um, one problem is that, as you uh, may have noticed, things get quite verbose quite quickly. Um, so for instance, in here, when you determine composition, when you define composition, you have to give explicitly these types. But you may say, look, if I tell you that this goes from A to B and this goes from B to C, why should I specify A, B, C here? This is information that you can get already. The point is that uh, in making arguments explicit, uh, the bugging is uh, usually easier. So that's why this stuff is explicit for now. But at some point, when the whole library is crystallized enough, this stuff will become implicit, will be made implicit. Um, yeah, that's another big problem. I mean, uh, many programmers in the audience, so you already know this, but every time you want to use quotients uh, in programming, it's, it's a nightmare, basically. Uh, what I mean by quotient is where I mean, namely is when, for instance, you take two things, two set of objects, and then you say, give me the set of objects where I enforce some equations. So I say, this must be equal to this. Now you see that if your structure is complicated enough, you may end up uh, having to recursively identify things, and this may actually be an infinite process in the end. So uh, quotients are really nasty when, when you do this stuff. Um, OK, let me give you an example of this. This is uh, the path category. Uh, it's basically a way to get a category from a graph. This is a very nice example because it's clean and you need, don't need quotient. Um, so what you say is that I give you a graph G, uh, and you want to build a category out of it. So as objects, you basically take the vertexes of G. G is just a bunch of points and a bunch of arrows between them. Uh, as morphisms, you take this kind of lists that they are in the form uh, vertex, edge, vertex, edge, blah, blah, blah. And the way you have to read this is that each one of these things is just an edge from this to this. So you see that this thing is basically a path in the graph. Um, identities are just this. So list with just like one vertex in it. And composition is basically done uh, by, by doing uh, list concatenation and uh, getting rid of one of these two things. So you just do them this way. Now, the really cool thing about this definition is that it already respects all the category theory axioms. Like if you compose one of these things with one of these things, you get exactly the same thing. Associativity holds by default. So you are able to prove that this definition is a category without any extra work. But if you try to do the same thing with a symmetric monoidal category, then everything is horrible. Because for instance, in a symmetric monoidal category, you have to enforce some equations that say, if I slide boxes in a certain way, nothing changes. And we don't really have a data structure that is able to naively uh, represent this. So I would love at some point to say, oh, actually, I have to enforce that this thing is equal to this other thing. And that's where you know quotients pop out and destroy all our dreams. Uh, so this is the implementation of a path category in Idris, for instance. Uh, so this is exactly equivalent in code to this thing. Uh, exactly, as I was saying, for instance, in uh, symmetric monoidal categories, you want to prove this equation. But there's really no way uh, without quotient. So you basically have two ways to deal with this. One of them is, OK, just like bring the cavalry in, give me a topic tech theory, and then everything works, boom. 
Um, and another way is basically using some techniques where you define these equations, but then you wrap them into some other types so that they don't make you know the type checker explode and don't like let, allow you to prove that whatever you do is inconsistent and whatever. Uh, yeah, and implementation of this in uh, homotopic type theory has been already worked out by Fred, which is there, uh, using uh, Agda. Yeah? Why can't you just give a proof like you give for associativity? That's just a proof of functionality for the tensor operation. So you don't really need to take quotients or anything like that. You can do it constructively. Uh, it really depends on what you are trying to prove that is a symmetric monolithic category. So for instance, you may we be willing to prove which Idris types and, that Idris types and functions form a symmetric monolithic category. You want to arrange uh, Idris types and functions into a symmetric monolithic category. Or, uh, for instance, you want a way to build a free symmetric monolithic category. So what is a free symmetric monolithic category? In the case of graphs, it's very easy. You give me a graph and you generate these lists. But when you do it with free SMCs, how do you build this thing? Like, who are your objects? Who are your morphisms? You have to basically come up with some data structures to do this. And when you try to do it, it turns out that you have to enforce quotients. No, I disagree. But oh, we'll talk about this later. Yeah. Um, so yeah, conclusion. Uh, yeah, basically, you have to remember that if you want to help us mathematician to do nice things, uh, try to avoid structures that use quotients. The less you use them, the happier we are. Um, then what we need, well, we need developers, more developers that contribute on this thing. Uh, we need more mathematicians that actually turn math into quotient-free math so we can implement it easily. Uh, we need investors that you know, turn math into money, which <laughs> would be very nice. And then we want co-investors that turn money into math. That's just because, you know, this is category theory, so you can take duals, so why not? And then you, yeah, if you like us on Twitter, which is actually very easy, and that's our handle, then, you know, like, you, you give a proof to us that what we do is not pointless. And yeah, that's it. That's basically how you put everything together, and, and this is our super secret plan for the future. Okay. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Uh, I mean, no, I don't really know. Uh, I, I probably this really depends on how. Like so, imagine indices everywhere, but it's hidden by the. Yeah. Yeah.